I'm pleased to welcome Kenneth Parker to Holy Cross to talk about historical narratives that hope to def hope help define our understanding of Christianity today. Ken is Associate Professor of Historical Theology at St. Louis University. The son of a pilgrim holiness pastor, Ken converted to Roman Catholicism after studying Christian history at Houghton College, Fuller Seminary, and the University of Cambridge. He served as a monk for five years at St. Andrew's Abbey in California, and then returned to academic life teaching history and theology. He's taught at St. Louis University for the last 20 years and was director of undergraduate studies from 1994 to 1997. Ken has published research on modern English theology and papal infallibility, the papal infallibility debates of the 1860s. In 2008, he co-edited Tradition and Pluralism, a volume of essays by leading scholars of religion that was in honor of Bill Shea, who was director of the McFarland Center before it was called the McFarland Center. Uh, last year, Ken published a for a popular audience a book titled Catholic and Cornered, Answers to Common Questions About Your Faith. Uh, he's had many scholarly books as well. Uh, he founded and directs, most interestingly to me, perhaps a uh, college in prison program at St. Louis University in which both inmates and prison employees have the opportunity to earn a fully accredited degree. The program's received a great deal of attention and a $150,000 gift from the William Randolph Hearst Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Parker. I could, I could give you a very dense lecture on uh, meta narratives and uh, the, uh, the, the four meta narratives that I teach to my PhD students successionism, supersessionism, developmentalism, and apprecessionism. And we'll talk about all those things. But I think it's more interesting to get some sense of, of how I got there. So that's where I would like to start uh, th this conversation. Uh, I'll, start, I'll start from the very beginning. Uh, I was born in North Carolina uh, in, the, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Elkin, North Carolina. My father was a pastor of a Pilgrim Holiness Church. And uh, so I grew up with a very, a very particular kind of understanding of Christianity uh, that was formed by the holiness tradition. Uh, the, the reason why I have two churches on, on the screen is that uh, the, uh, the church at the top was the church that my father pastored, uh, the Pilgrim Holiness Church in town, and the church at the bottom uh, was the Roman Catholic Mission Chapel uh, that had uh, space for just about five, uh, 35 people at most. A tiny, tiny chapel. In North Carolina at that time, uh, the Roman Catholic population was one half of 1% of, uh, of the state's population. I think it's now about 15, and that's because of the Hispanic immigration into North Carolina. But the, uh, the, the reason why this is special to me is because uh, I became aware of Roman Catholics by driving past this chapel uh, uh, every day to school. And the things that I was taught, this was an object lesson for me, was that you never want to be a Roman Catholic. Uh, and you don't want to be a Roman Catholic for many reasons, uh, but, for, uh, but reasons that, that, that I, w I had explained to me was that uh, Roman Catholics thought that they knew the truth and they had it all together. And, uh, and so... Uh, these are the things that I was taught that uh, Roman Catholics believed on the left-hand side. Uh, I was told that Roman Catholics believed that uh, at Pentecost, the deposit of faith was given to St. Peter, uh, and that, uh, that it was entrusted to Peter and bishops, and that these, uh, this truth was transmitted through bishops through the ages, and uh, that if you wanted to know what Christian truth was, uh, you look to the contemporary magisterium of the church. Uh, now, this is a, a way of thinking about the Christian past that, uh, that I've come to, to describe as successionism. Uh, it sees primitive Christianity as normative. Uh, it sees the, uh, the faith entrusted to a succession of bishops to ensure that it's pure. And uh, it, it affirms that Roman, the Roman Catholic Church is the locus of Christian truth. Now, my understanding of Christian history at that time uh, was very different. My understanding was, what I'd been taught as a, as a child, 
uh, that uh, the New Testament era was normative and pure. And, uh, and it was to the New Testament church that we should look to. Uh, everything after the New Testament was, uh, was corrupt. And uh, sadly, Christianity had gone astray very early on. But thankfully, I was a part of the group, uh, the, uh, the Pilgrim Holiness Church, which in the 1920s rediscovered the purity of the gospel. And, uh, and we had it all together, uh, unlike everybody else. Uh, even though we were a small denomination of about 40,000, uh, I was very grateful to live in a, uh, and grow up in a church uh, that uh, was truly Christian, unlike all of the other folks who imagine themselves to be Christian. Now, this is a form of, of uh, understanding the Christian past that's been with us for about five or 600 years. Uh, it's something that came to prominence during the Reformation, and it emphasizes the the original purity of early Christianity. Uh, it affirms the fact that there was a middle age. Uh, I use that, that word very inf uh, uh, because, I, because I think it's very important that we realize that our secular divisions of history are deeply influenced by, by this meta-narrative of the Christian past. Uh, but this middle age corrupted uh, Christian Christianity by human inventions, and that it was primitive Christianity that, uh, restored by those who had insights into what, it, what the New Testament really uh, was attempting to teach us in a later age. So uh, this became the dominant meta narrative for, for Protestants, Lutherans, Anglicans, uh, Presbyterians. In fact, supersessionism became something that, that uh, uh, tended to feed on itself so that uh, each successive reform saw what came previously to be nothing more than a corruption and its own version of Christianity, uh, the most pure and, and undefiled version of, of the faith. Now, I went off to college and uh, I went to Houghton College uh, in western New York and I majored in history and writing. And during that time, I began to lose confidence in the faith of my childhood. Uh, and part of that journey was uh, discovering uh, a little Episcopal church about 20 miles from the college, out in the middle of nowhere. I uh, couldn't find a picture of the, of the church, but, it, but this is a close approximation. And uh, it was in that little Episcopal church that I began to ask really searching questions uh, about the Christian past, trying to understand what, uh, what, the, what that past should look like. And these are some of the questions that I began to ask. Does Christian truth change over time? Uh, does the Holy Spirit continue to reveal truth through the Christian community? Uh, I found it really puzzling because I first discovered creeds through the uh, liturgy of the Episcopal Church. But I came to realize that creeds had, had been something that uh, grew out of controversy in, uh, in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th centuries. And I, I wondered why, why it was that creeds had to emerge in, amidst those kinds of tensions and why they were so revered by Roman Catholics and Episcopalians and, and, uh, and other uh, traditions that, that I had... Uh, seen as, as really marginal uh, before. Uh, and I also began to raise the question, can deeper Christian truths emerge even in our time? So is there development? Uh, this was a concept that, that uh, John Henry Newman uh, brought to the fore in the middle of the 19th century. And the concept of developmentalism as a meta narrative runs like this. Uh, in early Christianity, there were germs of nascent truths that uh, grew organically uh, in human time and experience. That uh, These are things that, that uh, Christians uh, didn't always agree about. Uh, they happened in the midst of controversy, human uh, failings. But, but ultimately, the work of the Holy Spirit 
uh, brought things to a, to a good and intended end. Uh, it resulted in a deeper and more expansive understanding of these truths. But I also was troubled by, by other things, and this was something that was going on in the Episcopal Church in the middle of the 70s, uh, intense debate over, uh, over the ordination of women. And uh, so the, the question that was being raised by the, by the old Anglo-Catholic priest who had been running the parish and the young, uh, sort of energetic, uh, dynamic young priest who had come to, to help him with the Allegheny County missions uh, was whether women should be ordained. Uh, did God really preserve uh, earliest Christians from error? Or were there things that, that in a later era we might understand better uh, than, than those in the past? And should we ignore uh, or explain away the injustices of the Christian past? Now, I call this... Uh, meta-narrative uh, apprecessionism uh, precisely because it, uh, it involves the, the term uh, to apperceive means to graft into uh, an established body of knowledge something that's new and, uh, and uh, not been a part of that established uh, system of knowledge in the past. Uh, it's been used, the, the term to apperceive has been used by educational psychologists for a long time. Uh, but apperceptionism as a meta narrative uh, fundamentally is about not privileging the Christian past. To make the argument that, that there are things that, uh, that even in the earliest age of Christianity uh, might stand uh, to be corrected. And that. Uh, the other, the, another element of apprecessionism is that it prioritizes the heightened consciousness of, of a given age uh, and charts a new way forward and thus reshapes the, the faith. Uh, I, I th when I think about this, I, I think uh, in terms of historical precedence uh, w about the, the issue of, of slavery. Uh, in the... Uh, in the middle of the 19th century, the Archbishop of St. Louis uh, was a man who owned slaves, and, uh, and his brother actually wrote an apology for, for slavery, Francis Kenrick. Uh, but 150 years later, uh, no Roman Catholic would, would consider slavery to be anything that's a part of Christianity at all. So there is a case of, of a heightened consciousness that brings about dramatic change and a reshaping of the Christian, uh, Christian tradition. Well, I decided as a result of those questions that I wanted to uh, understand more about the Christian past and turn it into a career. And so I went off to become a historical theologian. Uh, I went to Fuller Theological Seminary, uh, studied under Jeffrey Bromley, uh, who wrote the book on, on historical theology, quite literally. He wrote an introduction to the subject. And uh, then I went off to Cambridge to work on my PhD under Eamon Duffy, uh, who, uh, who's uh, become quite a celebrated Roman Catholic uh, historian. While I was at Cambridge, I became a Roman Catholic. Uh, and I did that, uh, at, uh, I, I began that journey uh, at Quar Abbey and uh, became a Roman Catholic in October of 1982. Uh, Joseph Warlow was the priest who helped me in many ways become, uh, make that decision. Uh, and if you're f you may be familiar with a, with a memoir called Father Joe. Uh, it's, a, it's about uh, this priest, a uh, very dynamic man, uh, a man that I, I, I still uh, revere a great deal. Uh, after I finished my, my PhD at Cambridge, I taught for a year at the University of Alabama and then went off to become a monk. And uh, while I was a, a Benedictine uh, for five years, uh, I began to be aware of all of these, uh, these ways of looking at the Christian past that, uh, that were swirling around. They weren't just my questions. They were questions that Roman Catholics were asking about their own tradition. Uh, I noticed that, that, uh, that Benedictines were trying to get past the corruptions of, uh, of, of the 
middle centuries of, of Benedictine practice and get back to the original Benedict. And so the RB80, which had just recently come out, was the text that we used in my novitiate. Uh, we were looking for that purer Benedictine tradition uh, behind the, the, uh, the, early, the, the later corrupted versions. And then when I went off to, uh, to study Catholic theology at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland, I uh, lived in, in a house full of Dominicans. And uh, the, it was the Dominican uh, professorial priory. And that was a fascinating experience because I began to uh, discover there uh, uh, very conservative Dominicans uh, who were very much a part of uh, a vision of Roman Catholicism that reflected that successionism that I'd been told Roman Catholics believed. Uh, one, one of the Dominicans uh, was actually teaching at Archbishop Lefebvre's uh, seminary. Uh, at the other end of the extreme, uh, there, was a, there, was a Benedic there was a Dominican who was uh, very interested in, uh, in, uh, in, in feminism and in Marxist ideology and, and trying to figure out ways to synthesize those ways of understanding the world uh, with Roman Catholic thought. Uh, needless to say, those two Dominicans didn't sit at the same table very often. Uh, it, was a, it was an interesting household to live in. Uh, but it was also a place where, where the, uh, uh, that, was, that was often used as a kind of think tank for the Vatican. And so uh, Dominicans were often going off to, uh, to take calls from, uh, from Cardinal Ratzinger or... Uh, or one of the other heads of congregations. Now, in 1992, after I left the monastery, I, I, I ended up in 1992 uh, at St. Louis University, and uh, uh, this man who just snuck in, uh, Bill Shea, uh, was the esteemed chair of, of the Department of Theological Studies there. And I've, uh, I've had 20 years in the department uh, teaching in the uh, historical theology PhD program, and I've been absolutely delighted to be there. Uh, one of the first course assignments that, uh, that Professor Shea gave me was to teach our uh, introduction to historical method. And so for the last 20 years, I've been reflecting on uh, the question of uh, how to understand the Christian past and how it fits in uh, the Roman Catholic tradition. And that's where I've really come to understand these four meta narratives successionism, supersessionism, developmentalism, and apprecessionism. Now, you may be wondering well, what does that have to do with, uh, with Roman Catholicism? How does that fit in? Well, uh, if, we, uh, if we look at, uh, at the condition of Roman Catholic theology today, uh, we realize that there is a, uh, there is a lot of turmoil. And what I've come to realize is that that conflict has at its roots uh, historiographical assumptions about how to appropriate the Christian past and how we use it uh, to, in, our, in our theological discourse. And that tension is uh, not just between scholars, but it's between scholars and church authorities. Now, uh, I want to point to the Second Vatican Council as a place where we can see the, uh, these tensions emerging in high relief. So I'd like to start with, uh, with events that actually uh, uh, were preparatory to the, the Second Vatican Council and the efforts by uh, Cardinal Ottaviano uh, to, to really uh, keep in place what had been the dominant meta-narrative of the Christian past, uh, successionism. Uh, you'll notice that he's quite committed to that because his motto uh, uh, was uh, semper atum, uh, always the same. And, uh, and the draft document uh, that he uh, oversaw, uh, De Fontibus Revelationis, uh, maintained a, a successionist meta-narrative. Uh, this is the document that was roundly rejected uh, by, the, uh, by the fathers of the Second Vatican Council. And uh, they, 
they instead set up a new commission uh, that spent the next three years working on a document that became Dei Verbum. Uh, a very different document in many, many ways that highlighted and, and gave priority to historical criticism. Uh, something that Cardinal Ottaviano uh, was vehemently opposed to. Well, uh, among those radicals, uh, uh, radicals is probably too strong a word, but, but reforming theologians at the Second Vatican Council uh, were people like Yves Congar and his friend uh, Joseph Ratzinger. And they were theologians in a, uh, in a new tradition uh, known as ressourcement. Uh, the ressourcement movement in the 1930s and 40s and 50s uh, was, uh, was a movement that was convinced that the neo-scholasticism of, uh, of the late 19th and early 20th century uh, had ossified Catholic theology, that there was no way forward. And the only way forward was to uh, set aside that, uh, that desiccated tradition that uh, had a stranglehold on theology and to get behind it to the uh, original sources or to the classic documents of the church. And uh, so, so uh, Eve Congar was, was one of the great uh, articulators of this. Uh, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Danielou was another. Uh, de Lubach uh, was another. Uh, Ratzinger, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, Joseph Ratzinger was a, was a, was a latecomer to that, uh, but he was certainly deeply influenced and, and uh, uh, enthusiastic about the findings of race or small theologians. And both of them were active in, in the composition of, of documents at the Second Vatican Council. Uh, you'll notice down here, uh, Perfecte uh, Caritatis, uh, the document on the renewal of religious life, is a, uh, is a document that specifically invokes this kind of meta-narrative. It says that religious orders need to be uh, going back to the original sources uh, to discern again what their vocations should be. Now, developmentalism uh, was something that really dominated the council. Uh, and, uh, and it was uh, really the fruit of the work of, of John Henry Newman. Uh, his uh, essay on the development of Christian doctrine, published in 1845, uh, just as he was becoming a Roman Catholic, uh, this is when he converted, uh, was, a, uh, was a document that, that while it wasn't original, People have been talking about doctrinal development for decades before that. But his essay really uh, crystallized for the public this concept. And, uh, and so more often than not, you'll find that, uh, that the development of doctrine or the theory of development of doctrine is attributed to Newman. Now, it's fascinating that, that uh, Pope Paul VI, who finished up the council after... Uh, John the 23rd died, called uh, the Second Vatican Council and the era after it, Newman's Hour. Uh, and uh, he did that in, in uh, no small part because of the powerful influence of Newman's concept of development. You'll notice down here that uh, Dignitatis uh, Humanae, the decree on religious liberty, explicitly invokes uh, doctrinal development uh, in the document itself. Uh, very important point, as we'll see in a moment. Now, where does apprecessionism come in? Uh, it seems an unlikely thing to have happened at, at, at the council, uh, but in the, in the last major speech that, that John the Twenty-Third gave, uh, he articulated it in a way that was really quite striking. Uh, I'd like to read that for you. Uh, he said, since women are becoming ever more conscious of their human dignity, they will not tolerate being treated as mere material instruments, but demand rights befitting a human person, both in domestic and in public life. Striking language. Striking language. And it's language that, that emphasizes that there has been injustice in the past done to women. And women need to be given their proper place. Uh, in society, 
that's been denied them. Now, a very similar kind of language is found in Gaudium et Spes, uh, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. So we can see now that, uh, that all four of these meta narratives of the Christian past, in one way or another, found their way into the documents of the Second Vatican Council. So, where did that take us? And I'd like to use the case of uh, Joseph Ratzinger uh, to illustrate my point. Uh, it's taken us into a period of some confusion uh, because we tend to invoke these not really thinking about the implications. Uh, one of the things that's quite striking is that uh, in the immediate aftermath of, of the Second Vatican Council, Professor Ratzinger uh, critiqued successionism, uh, Cardinal Ottaviano's uh, uh, favorite approach to the Christian past. Uh, in his commentary on De Verbum, uh, he pointed out that, that, uh, that the Vincentian canon, a uh, fifth century uh, way of understanding uh, the nature of doctrine or, or, or orthodoxy, uh, quote semper, quote ubique, quote ab omnibus, uh, which means uh, uh, what has been accepted uh, always, everywhere, and by all. Uh, Ratzinger said it's no longer, it no longer appears as an authentic representative of the Catholic idea of tradition. Vincent's static semper no longer seems the right way of of expressing the problem. So we have uh, Professor Ratzinger rejecting successionism. About uh, 25 years, no, uh, about 17 years later, uh, when uh, Joseph Ratzinger became Cardinal Ratzinger and Prefect of the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, he also spoke positively about, uh, about developmentalism. Uh, he said of, of Newman's concept of development that it was a decisive and fundamental concept of Catholicism. And he praised Vatican II because it had the merit of having formulated, uh, for the f formulated it for the first time in a solemn magisterial document. He said this in 1986. Uh, so Cardinal Ratzinger is aware of, of this concept of development supplanting what had been the neo-scholastic meta-narrative of the Christian past. Now, before we, before we go on to, uh, to, to Pope Benedict XVI, uh, I think it's really important to, to recognize that, that there, there's a a caveat that needs to be made here, because in, in 1994, uh, when Pope John Paul II issued his document, uh, uh, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, uh, a letter on uh, the issue of the ordination of women, uh, the Pope was very clear about the fact that uh, from his understanding of the Christian past, women had never been ordained, there could never be uh, women ordained, uh, because Christ had only appointed men as apostles. And when, uh, when the, when, when the uh, uh, adubium was, was sent to, to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, what was fascinating was that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger invoked the Vincentian Canon uh, in his response. So we find in, uh, uh, in someone as important and as uh, intelligent, well-informed, well-engaged uh, as, uh, as Cardinal Ratzinger, someone who's using meta-narratives depending on the subject and depending on the issue uh, to, to make his point. Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, in his first Christmas address, condemned what he called the hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture and praised the hermeneutic of reform. Uh, this, in effect, was a uh, repudiation of apprecessionism, uh, as I would understand it, 
uh, in his argument against discontinuity and rupture and an affirmation of, uh, of the supersessionism and developmentalism of the race or small movement. Now, the reason why he, uh, he affirmed uh, the latter was that, it, in his view, it bears new life and new fruit and achieves renewal in the continuity of the church which the Lord has given to us. Uh, invoking invoking a, a, a way of looking at the past, approaching the past, uh, but with a very clear theological goal in mind. Now he goes on in, in the statement uh, to say that uh, he recognizes that the documents of the Second Vatican Council actually affirm discontinuity with the past. But in, a, in, in language that I, f I, I will admit I find very confusing, uh, he asserted that uh, the various distinctions between concrete historical situations and their requirements had been made. The continuity of principles proved not to have been abandoned. Uh, so you can see that, that, uh, that he's struggling to, to argue that, uh, that even though the documents of the Second Vatican Council acknowledge that there are times when discontinuity with previous tradition is necessary, that somehow continuity has to be maintained. I, he goes on, and I apologize for the lengthy quote, uh, but it's, it's one that I, that I think is really very important to, uh, to reflect on. Uh, he says, it is precisely in this combination of continuity and discontinuity at different levels that the very nature of true reform consists. Uh, in this process of innovation and continuity, we must learn to understand more practically than before that the church's decision is on contingent matters, for example, certain practical forms of liberalism or free interpretation of the Bible should necessarily be contingent themselves precisely because they refer to a specific reality that is changeable in itself. What he's trying to argue here is that, that uh, there, there are historical uh, developments uh, within the church that are local, uh, um, located in time and place that may be set aside at some point, may need to be set aside at some point, and that these are contingent, but these are contingent matters. They're not at the core of the faith. So, where does that take us? The two of the quotes that, that are among my favorites uh, by, by, by popes is one by Pope Leo XIII when he opened the Paleographical School uh, at, the papal, at, at the Vatican Archives. Uh, uh, that quote reads, uh, the church has nothing to fear from the quest for truth. And John Paul II, a little over 100 years later, said, faith has nothing to fear from historical research. Now, I, I found and I've written elsewhere about many examples where, where the church really hasn't come to terms with historical evidence, where there is fear of where that might lead us. Uh, the great question is, is this an eschatological hope? Is it something that's well into the future? Or can we begin to hope for the possibility that Roman Catholics can, uh, can face historical research, pursue uh, historical reconstruction of the past uh, without fear or anxiety? My argument, my answer to that question is that we must first be conscious of the meta-narratives that we use and why we employ them. Final slide. How do we come to terms with the past? I would argue that we must face without fear the need to revision the Christian past in order to resource the future study of Christian truth claims. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that we need to be aware of the fact that 
we have four meta narratives uh, that, that Roman Catholics employ. Uh, we need to be explicit about wh- why, uh, why we use them and why they're appropriate for, uh, for any given subject. Uh, I, in working with, with my PhD students, I'm often, uh, I often find that they want to know, well, which is the correct one now? And my answer to that is that it, it depends. Uh, we, have to, we have to look at the subject uh, uh, that we're dealing with at the moment to understand uh, the appropriate uh, meta narrative to employ in narrating that particular subject. Where, that, where is this going to take us? I really don't know. I think Roman Catholics have got a lot of work to do uh, to come to terms with this. But the thing that I take comfort in is that, that we're in good company. I think all of the Christian traditions are struggling with the same issue. Uh, the rise of historical consciousness is something that, that Christians are, uh, are still trying to sort out. Uh, and church authorities in particular struggle with this reality uh, because in many ways what those of us who, who do as historical theologians uh, is often seen and perceived as being a threatening, uh, setting ourselves up as an alternative authority. Uh, that's not, I think, the intent of, of most uh, scholars of, of historical theology. I think we're in a quest for truth in the same way that, that, uh, that the authorities of the church are. But a constructive engagement between scholars and church authorities is what's needed uh, to, uh, to, to hurl condemnations or to criticize uh, without fully understanding the, the underpinnings of our theological arguments, all of which are necessarily appeals to the Christian past in one way or another, is something that we have to acknowledge and work toward a constructive synthesis for the future. Sure. All right. Sure. Uh, Pope Benedict's consistency or, or use of different narratives, but I would guess that bo- most of us use different narratives, and that that's. I mean, you're saying it's sort of oh, yes. got to be okay. There's, there's no. You probably don't use many. I can't think of a time when Vincent of Lorraine and I would agree anymore and say, you know, because <coughs> historical context is what we say. I can't think of much, but always and everywhere. Upon. Right. Um, so, how do you think we do properly use them or judge when we're not just uh, cherry picking from the past? Uh, I like this, I don't like that. Um, how, how do we develop kinds of reliable norms about how we. Hmm. I, it, that's, that's, a, that, that's a question that I constantly struggle with. And, and in, in talking uh, with, with my, my PhD students in seminars, we, we debate that issue a great deal, and, and, I, and I think that it, that it often depends on, on the subject matter. Uh, uh, the, uh, there, there are questions for Roman Catholics that, that seem to be very settled and have been for a number of centuries. Uh, the, the, the creeds uh, have been in place for, for quite a long time. Uh, the, uh, the issues that, that are found there are things that... that uh, one might look to at, at least as, as symbols as part of our tradition that, that has, uh, reflects a certain kind of successionism. But uh, there, there are times, as the race for small theologians uh, recognized in the early, early 20th century, when things have become so, um, uh, so hardened that, that uh, there's no room for creativity and there's an absolute need uh, to, to break out of that, to look for new ways forward. Uh, an example of, of, of that uh, in the wake of, of um, 
John Paul II's letter on, on the ordination of women has been the work of Gary uh, Mackey. Uh, the Hidden Tradition of, of the Ordination of Women uh, is the title of that book, I think. And in, in that book, he does very responsible historical scholarship that reconstructs uh, the, uh, the evidence of women being ordained as ordination was understood in late antiquity in the early medieval period. And the decline and elimination of that pattern of ordination uh, around the 12th, 13th century. Uh, there's an example of, of supersessionism being used in a very constructive way um, to, to uh, using, using historical evidence uh, responsibly uh, to provide a basis for a very serious uh, discussion. Uh, you may be for certain kinds of audiences a much more effective argument uh, than to argue in an apprecessive sense that because of the heightened consciousness of women in the last century uh, that women have a right to be ordained now with no, you know, assuming that there's no precedent in the past. I'm thinking of reading of Paul Griffith's book now where he's going back to Augustine and drawing some distinctions and I'm looking at them and thinking, that's great Augustine, but I don't think they have any relevance for us now, you know, right. nothing about, nothing to disagree with the magisterium or anything, but as I'm looking back at those, right. it's just like, oh, these are curiosities about Augustine, but you know, I'm making a decision that really I can't see how that has any relevance for the world today. Right. Yet there are other things that I would look at in historiography that way and I say, see, we did that before. Exactly. Now we can do that. And I don't know if there's any way to really use that consistently. No, no, and I and I and I and I and I think that's the that that's exactly the point that that I'm wanting to make that that uh, these meta narratives are actually tools for theological discourse, and to be explicit about them rather than having them as hidden, uh, unacknowledged uh, assumptions in that discourse uh, only leads to misunderstanding and division. Uh, that's part of what I, what I was trying to get at uh, in, in describing my own, my own journey, intellectual journey uh, of sorts, to realize that, that, uh, that there were certain hidden assumptions that I had about, about the tradition that I was born and raised in, that uh, on reflection, with, with more experience and, and more understanding, uh, did not really accurately reflect uh, the, the Christian past. During my experience with Bene Benedictines, as a Benedictine, the, uh, the, the, the effort to retrieve that purer tradition was something that, that, uh, that we were all about. And my novice master, uh, Luke Dysinger, uh, who's who's now a a, a scholar uh, uh, in his in his own right? He has a D. Phil from from Oxford. Uh, was was always pushing us to, to to be aware of, and the corruptions that that he was concerned about had as much to do with with liturgical practice as it did with the rule. Uh, he was he was always explaining to us that that Salem didn't get it right uh, and, that, uh, and that the liturgical norms the, uh, for Gregorian chant were something other than those published volumes from, from, uh, from Salem Abbey in, in, uh, in France in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Yeah, uh, But I, I would say that, that, uh, that in recent decades, uh, Jesuits, at least some Jesuits, have been more open to the apprecessive. Uh, and I would see liberation theology as being uh, a, a, a real expression of, of that, uh, to uh, the heightened consciousness of, of the need to be present to those at the margins of society. Uh, it certainly animated some of my work uh, that I do uh, in, in, the, um, in the college and prison program that I run at St. Louis University. Yeah. Should, should priests be allowed to marry? Uh, should we have the option in the Western tradition to have married priests? There are, there are some people, in fact, many people who are quite shocked. I actually had this question asked uh, by a layperson the other day, uh, a, a, not a Catholic, but who had had a casual, con in, in casual conversation with a Roman Catholic friend, had said, 
you know, I think that there was a time when Roman Catholic priests could marry. And the Roman Catholic friend said, absolutely not. It's never happened in the history of the Catholic Church. And, uh, and she said, well, I thought I read... No, couldn't possibly be. And she said, could you tell me, have Roman Catholic priests ever been allowed to marry? And I said, well, yeah. It's only been a tradition in the Catholic Church for about a thousand years. Uh, and it was a reform movement, uh, you know, which I could explain to you another time. But, but the question is now, is it so ingrained in the practice of, of, uh, of Roman Catholics in the, in the Latin rite that we can't have married priests? Uh, uh, some, would, some would say that the tradition needs to be preserved. That's a kind of successionist argument uh, based on that reform. Uh, uh, whereas there would be others uh, who would argue that, that we're, we're in a new age, we're in a new era. You know, your, your reference to... Uh, the sex abuse crisis is, uh, is, a, uh, is an interesting one that people also often bring up in tandem. You know, are, are we creating a situation where uh, there's, there's an uh, unhealthy focus uh, for, for some in the priesthood? Uh, that, uh, that, that could be treated as a kind of apprecessive argument. You know, we have a new circumstance. We have to deal with it in a new way. Uh, not to mention the fact that, that we're rapidly uh, running out of priests in the West. And, uh, and because, of, because of the issue of celibacy, it, it appears. Um, I, I know many, many young men and, and women as well uh, who, uh, who would willingly pursue ordination uh, if, if uh, celibacy was off the table. But, you know, that's... Uh, that's, a, that's another one of those arguments about something very important in the life of the church today that's informed by how we look at the Christian past. And the arguments that are being made are being made based on these meta narratives. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're, you're speaking of, of John the um, uh, uh, Pachamenteras speech and, and Gaudium et Spes. Uh, in both those cases, they're talking about the heightened consciousness of women in the, in the 1960s and uh, the, the awareness that, that, uh, there's, that there was a movement afoot uh, that could, not, could no longer be denied. And uh, you know, the, the, the makeup of the council, the, uh, the visuals of the council said something otherwise. And in fact, probably uh, was the single most important reason for the radicalization of a theologian like Mary Daly. And Mary Daly was doing a, uh, a doctorate at, at the University of Fribourg uh, during the council, time of the council. She traveled down to, to Rome uh, and uh, was up in the gallery observing the uh, accession of, of the council and was positively scandalized by this sea of red, about 2,500 uh, bishops from around the world uh, gathered a lot of pomp and, and ceremony uh, about their entrance and way off in a little corner uh, on the edge of one of the transepts in a little balcony were a half dozen women, uh, most of them uh, uh, dressed in, in very severe black habits of one sort or another. Uh, and they were auditors. They were, they were not allowed to speak. Uh, so women had no place at the council. And for Mary Daly, that was a searing condemnation. And, and so for her, uh, that, that radicalized her in many ways. And she, she writes about that in, in some of her books. Uh, there's an example of, uh, of, of how a heightened consciousness causes a dramatic shift. John the XXIII had, had an insight there uh, the council fathers seem to be affirming that in, uh, in their statement in Gaudium et Spes about the role of women uh, in society uh, and that it shouldn't be denied. And yet, uh, there's not been a lot of acting, acting on that principle uh, in the decades that, are, that have followed the Second Vatican Council.
Here's, here's, where, here's where I really put on my historian's hat. Uh, you know, I, I, ideas are, 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 are wonderful, but uh, uh, ideas are, are always experienced in a context, uh, in a lived context. And so uh, to, to, to argue that, that we can look at, uh, at articulations of the faith in isolation uh, from the way in which we implement and practice of those ideas is uh, uh, is, is something that, that I, I, I find I'm not capable of doing. Uh, I, I, I read when I read works that that treat uh, ideas as though they 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 happen in the ether. Uh, I always find that troubling, and but to but to look at at the Second Vatican Council in this situation. It's a it's a self-styled pastoral council, and so they were very conscious of the fact that they weren't just dealing with dogmatic issues or uh, uh, or issues of defining doctrine, but they were concerned to to deal with how the how the church interacts and functions in the world, and so that that has very practical implications, and and so these statements about about the place of women in the life of, uh, uh, of communities, the church included, uh, uh, ends up being something that, that, uh, that's of profound importance coming out of the council. Yeah. I think about the question sort of where you set the limits at, but it, it sort of oh, it yes. opens, it opens some doors. It does. That I don't, you know, you look at John the 23rd, who seems barely aware of the implications of what he was doing. Right. Still like to ride around in the right. city of Justoria. Still like to wear the beacon. You know, like yeah. things sort of as they were, but was willing to sort of open them up. And you know, if you don't go to on women, which was a tiny little crack that was open, but if you look at our relation to non-Christians, right. to churches, to the Jews, to religious freedom, to all of those things. I mean, those were all things that really ignored tons of precedent. Absolutely. I mean, you had to go so far back beyond those. And uh, so I think that you know the, the difficulty that we're in has to do with. How many times we did do that, right? And then when you came, hold it. When you try to say, "Oh, but we stopped here," right? That didn't quite make any sense to anyone. Unless there's the spirit of the council or something, you know. Right. Ratzinger says, "Well, forget. Don't talk about the spirit of the council. We'll just talk about where it went." But everyone says, "Well, you, once you've opened that door, you, you've opened the door." And, that's and 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 there's and there's the there's the controversy that I'm talking about. It's an unresolved question, uh, and and one that 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 I. Clearly, we're, we're not going to come to terms with or find a resolution for anytime soon. I think the issue that, that, uh, that, you're, that you're getting at is, is really uh, ways of looking at the world. And, uh, and if, I, if I can use very, very uh, generic, but, but I, I think they may be helpful ways of talking about this. You know, the the, the pre-modern world, world was the world of successionism. Uh, in many ways, uh, the, uh, the the modern world uh, was uh, was one that that was that gave rise to uh, certain aspects of historical consciousness that enabled us to think about the past as something other than us and our experience. The postmodern world is a world in which we. Uh, we find ourselves able to step back and say, oh, I can see how this is a way of constructing reality. And, uh, and so in many ways, this is a, what I've talked about is really a, a fruit of that, that postmodern discourse, that, uh, that awareness of the fact that, that uh, you know, we can and must Think about the way that we're constructing the reality that we live in. Uh, this semester, I've been teaching world civilization to our incarcerated students in the prison program, and uh, and a very perceptive uh, young man uh, who's a legal clerk. Uh, when I started off my my uh, my world civ class by talking about meta narratives, you, you can tell I've I recycle this stuff a lot. Uh, he. He, he listened to it for a while, and I said, well, now, I, I'm talking, I'm talking as, a, as a historian of Christianity, but I think it has applications elsewhere. And uh, Ray, uh, Raymond Scott uh, said, uh, 
piped up after we had sort of gone through the meta narratives, and he said, "You know, you can do that with legal history." And he started talking about different ways in which uh, you could you could use all four of these uh, to uh, to to deal with legal matters or legal precedent. So it it it, it is it is something that I that I think is is really uh, a valuable tool, but to have it in the uh, in the uh, in the toolbox to, to to carry on fruitful and fruitful discussion is is, is really very important. I mean, we're we're an ecumenical program at, uh, at uh, in our historical theology program. Uh, we have students who are Roman Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, and the thing that's really exciting and dynamic about that experience is that we can use this language of meta narrative to talk about each other's traditions and each other's theological ideas in ways that are not threatening, that are not accusatory, that are not judgmental. Uh, and, and it leads to uh, conversations that, that, are, that, that promote understanding and, and genuine caring across ecclesial divides. That it is necessary in a self-critical way to look at, look at the narratives that you're creating and recognize that you have a choice in in that in that uh, in that constructive process. That there has to be at the at, at the uh, at the base of the work of of a of a theologian, a historical theologian, uh, uh, a very a very strong uh, moral impulse uh, to seek the truth as 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 we can find it. I. Uh, I think that that's that that that's that's always been the goal of every generation of sincere seeker. Uh, the tools that we've had available to do that uh, have been different for different generations. Uh, we can't step back from or uh, forget the postmodern moment. Uh, we have to live in it, and we have to we have to understand how to deal with it. In ways that that are uh, that are going to be constructive and, and productive for the Christian tradition, uh, I think this is one of the ways that we do that. Does that? Uh, and and to and, and to and in an expression of charity uh, to, uh, uh, to to Pope Benedict, I would say you know uh, he should read my essay. 